Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream Q&A segment, January something or other. January 21st. 21st. Yes, we're January a third of the 21st. way through winter. Yes, we are. Hell yeah. Third of the way through winter, that's something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we made it. It is. A third of the way. Yeah, seasonal talk, seasonal weed talk I can do today. I don't, somehow the, the math talk wasn't working, although no. a third of the way through winter. Wow. Okay. Whew. We are going to spend an hour answering your questions. We're going to start with the question from the Discord server, mm. where the people on the Discord vote every week on what question they most want us to answer, and we start there. And we're going to make the kitty cat a little bit more visible, so he's a little camera shy. There we go. This is Tesla. He's very tired. Book-related question on the appendix. You discuss the hypothesis that the appendix is a safe house for the gut flora that repopulates the gut with good gut flora after gastrointestinal illness, and that appendicitis could be the result of Western lifestyles that make diarrhea relatively rare. This seems to suggest that occasionally inducing diarrhea might be good for our health. Thoughts? I admit that this is not something that had occurred to me before. I think um, if you are just thinking about the health of the appendix, the answer might indeed seem to be yes, but there are other harms from diarrhea that aren't incorporated into the analysis yet. And I don't know all of the known harms, and we certainly, none of us know what the unknown to us yet uh, harms of diarrhea are. Uh, one of them is one that most modern Westerners can deal with, which is losing, you know, losing the nutrients yeah. from the food that you ate. Uh, without incorporating them into your into your body, um, but it's uh, I just I, I feel like I know of some other harms or risks, but I can't think of exactly what they Dehydration are. Dehydration being one. Dehydration is another big one. I yep. probably again from you know if you're if you're a Westerner living in you know yep. modern situation and you're not traveling, it's probably not. A big risk for you, but that, I mean that's uh, you're right. That that even more than uh, nutrient loss is the big, the big risk if you're uh, if you don't have access to a lot of water. Yeah, uh, my guess is the the core of this question is somewhere else. Okay. So we do a lot of screwy things that result in the gut flora that we have being more arbitrary than they should be. So it's not obvious that the isolate that the appendix would house is a particularly good isolate. It might be. What I'd mm. like to know is, is there a system that the body uses to detect when the gut is working particularly well, mm-hmm. that it takes an isolate at that moment? Mm. And could it, if your gut flora changed over as a result of you encountering something new, and it was improved over the gut flora that had been the previous isolate, is there some mechanism for the appendix to trade it out for the better functioning isolate? And I don't know that we have any insight on this. In other words, I think, you know, it took us long enough to get to the obvious, which was this is not a vestigial organ. This is an active organ that is less important for modern folks because we're not resource stressed and so the time period to get re-inoculated is is irrelevant to Mm well-being what is not irrelevant to well-being is the arbitrariness of the gut flora and so things like fecal transplants are important but only necessary in many cases because it is likely that you will have very suboptimal gut flora which is probably the result of the fact that we eat things that favor uh, overgrowth of, of, of one things. strain over another yep. and, and or other things may be entirely missing from our diet. We have no way to get them. Yep. Um, so anyway, I think there's a huge amount of value to be had in figuring out what the natural ecology of the gut is mm-hmm. and figuring out what role the appendix plays. And uh, I... I I doubt that just if you didn't change anything else, just simply inducing diarrhea is probably not a good idea. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think both of these answers are 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 relevant. That are they they both arrive you with that answer. Yeah. Right. And that ultimate answer. All right. Next question from DarkHorseSubmissions.com. 
Presumably, there is an optimal middle between inbreeding and outbreeding depression. Could human aesthetic in-group preference be a cultural or epigenetic mechanism, cultural slash, cultural and, epigenetic mechanism by which evolution self-calibrates to this range? Could peacock tails have the same purpose on the genetic level, i.e. delineating lineages in a hard to forge way? Hard to forge. Um, first part of the question, I would say yes, certainly. By definition, there will be an optimal range. But I would point out that it is not the only contributor that is likely to be a factor in such preferences. In other words, as the question is delivered, the objective is optimal function, right? How far from your own lineage should one go to escape the inbreeding risks and not to create new risks that come from potentially combining incoherent uh, sets of genes? Yep. Now, that latter thing is less of a danger than you would think, right? Naively, you might think that that's a big danger, but then if you look at something like domestic dogs, which are really the only competitor amongst animals that I know of that has the same kind of range of phenotypic variability, right? You can combine any two dogs and you get a coherent dog. That means the developmental program is capable of taking the genes in these disparate genomes and making them work together. Do they work to, you know, presumably some combinations work better than others, but the whole thing works remarkably well. Okay. But it's hard not to imagine the combinations that you probably wouldn't work right when talking about putting different breeds of dogs together right but once upon a time before the invention of the labradoodle you might have thought that was on the list and yet yeah although at least they were roughly the same size yeah um but anyway uh, the other contributor which does not inherently have anything to do with function is that the genes in a genome may be interested in getting as many similar copies as they can. And so in other words, there may be a kind of um, sexual racism that isn't about function, that is about genes doing their own bidding that you shouldn't really care about at the level of function. Mm -hmm. My guess is actually that's a huge fraction of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, but it will tend to manifest, like people if asked will tell you a cultural story, an epigenetic story about why their preferences are what they are, even if it, even if it might be Right. Uh, something that is uh, underlaying that. But you would also imagine uh, a, there is an untold, very politically incorrect story about asymmetries in attraction. Mm -hmm. In other words, males who are sexually attracted but not interested in investing um, may be much less discerning at this level mm -hmm. than... Yes. Yeah. So anyway... Yeah, bound to be a very politically incorrect story should we ever come to discover the dimensions of it. Indeed. Is that it? Is that mm -hmm. where we're going to stop? All right. You know who Gabe Brown is? I do not. Doesn't ring a bell. <clears throat> Gabe Brown's regenerative agricultural success in soil and fertility building appears to disprove the uh, discussion, the beaver discussion that you and Jacob had, the claims about fertility. Please watch one of his lectures. Wait, wait, wait. And there's wait, a link. Wait, wait, wait. But I, if, if I don't, and if you don't know who this person is, he has given a link. You know, I don't know. Neil Brown's regenerative agricultural success in soil fertility building appears to disprove. No, I don't think so. I so. don't. Fr from the way that question is written, I don't see how. Uh, there could be a disproof. Right. And it doesn't. Um, doesn't but I don't me. know. All, I haven't listened to all of your conversation yet. And I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about Gabe Brown. So it seems seems unlikely. But, um, you know, and it's an hour and 40 minute video. So, you know, yeah. there's, there's lots there's lots of things we are asked to assess. And there literally aren't enough hours in the day. So, yeah, um, we might. I mean, we could ask Jacob and see if he knows yep. if he's ever heard of the guy. But I mean, I think the basic answer is whatever's in there, hard to imagine how it disproves the beaver's contribution to the fertile soils and uh, the depletion of modern agriculture, which um, is non 
equilibrium in nature. My guess is what yeah. uh, this guy has is an equilibrium system or one that is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, building. Yeah, fertility building. Yeah. Um, cool. Awesome. Yep. That, that people and I, I know I know of stories. Just haven't heard of this guy. Um, of you know of people who have used various techniques. Sure. Uh, to build soil fertility, but. Um, Alley cropping. Like A L L E Y, like alleys. Well, now you're in a realm that I'm well, not expert like, in, but yes. Uh, okay, not like a woman named Alley. Correct. Um, well, I remind me. <clears throat> excuse me. What remind me? What alley cropping is? Yeah, you grow a legume between the target crop, and you mm. prune it into and the you, gullies and, and effectively till it in. Yep. Yeah, it's to to get your nitrogen. To get your nitrogen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and letting fields lay fallow, and you know, Sweden, and you know, there's all, all sorts, all sorts of techniques. Um, I guess I don't know claims about fertility that you or Jacob would have made. Um, would have basically been um, our soils are depleted now, and uh, beavers would help with that. That's yes. my the, at the broad brush. That's what I expect the claims were, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Given your understanding of the lives of cells, what do you think of chemotherapy? Hmm. Well, uh, let's for, let's first start with a chemotherapy paradox. We had a cat die of cancer years ago, and the cat was quite old, eighteen, I think. Talking about Sasha. Uh, this was Abercrombie. Abercrombie. Um, and anyway we had a discussion with the vet about the possibility of chemotherapy and it didn't make sense in light of how old an animal this was. This was an animal at the end of his life. But what surprised me was that chemotherapy in cats, according to the vet, was very successful and didn't have any of the awful side effects that we know from human chemotherapy. So that does lead to a what the hell kind of question. Why yeah. would that be? Yeah. I will also say Well, we don't know how chemotherapy in cats differs. Right? Like, you know, chemotherapy. Well, why should it I mean, as a general category, it shouldn't differ at all. Well, but I mean there there's some compounds that sure. more more so for dogs, but like there's some things that can't you know, cats sure. have a different diet than humans. There's some things that they can't eat that we can and vice versa. I sure, think. but so, chemotherapy is bound to involve many, many different compounds for different types of cancer, and that's gonna be true for cats. Too. So I, it's not surprising to me that some chemotherapy... If it was different and you could get that response in cats, why wouldn't you also get that response in humans? Right. Yeah. And I will also say there's another place where I see the same style of paradox. And I'm not even sure that this one isn't just bullshit. But um, we seem to have a lot of trouble when we have capital punishment finding a combination of drugs that reliably extinguishes the convicted person uh, With painlessly, minimal pain. yeah. right, and yet we use them as animals routinely, and by all appearances, it is completely effective. And there's no reason in the world that this should be any different with a human being. Uh, besides dosage, there's no reason it should be different with a human being versus a dog or a cat. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of think it's just bullshit. And um, at some level, we're not trying to find those compounds, and we haven't bothered to ask a vet because um, that would be, you know. The cruelty is a feature, not a bug. Um, <clears throat> so that's my cynical take. But um, but anyway, yep. uh, chemotherapy is a bummer. I do believe that the basic premise of kill the cancer faster than you kill the patient is viable, but mm -hmm. that it is bound to be it is bound to accelerate aging across the body. That's that's that, that's where I think the question <clears throat> is originating from. Right, yep. like given your work on. Yeah. Senescence and telomeres and such. Yep. Won't, won't it cause um, distributed aging in various cellular lineages across the body yep. or at least anywhere the chemo hits? Yeah. Yep, it will. Right. I will say um, someone we know and love had uh, breast cancer, had it removed, and had a kind of therapy, not chemo, but radiation that struck me as extremely clever, mm -hmm. where instead of the problem with radiation is if you have a beam of radiation, it goes through the patient, right? All the way through the healthy tissues and the suspect tissues. Um, in this person's case, they embedded temporarily the radioactive element so it could irradiate so the it, surrounding tissue. And you get like the exponential decay 
like it's right at, it's right at source where it needs to be and you know is it getting into a little little bit into a little bit of healthy tissue yes but it was so localized yeah it was and just so barely perfect. and in, in fact i forget which kind of decay it is if it's beta decay but there's one of the kinds of decay remember. that doesn't penetrate very far yeah um, and so anyway, this struck me as very elegant. It took something that is uh, draconian, mm -hmm. medically draconian, and made it, you know, yeah. trivially bad. No, and this is, I mean, this was cutting edge in, I guess this probably would have been 2014. Um, and it still feels like, wow, I, I'm amazed that we can do that. Yep. Really it's, extraordinary. It's a great technology. And yeah. in principle, there is no reason you couldn't do something like this with chemo, where the idea is that something that breaks down... Uh, is embedded or probably better uh, more to the point you could use something like uh, monoclonal antibodies that are specifically programmed for your uh, chemical idiosyncrasies of your cancer mm. to basically float around and not stick to you and then stick to the cancer and deliver the um, the chemical toxin right to the location. I, I know that that's the kind of thing that people have been playing with for years, so mm -hmm. I don't know that it's ever come to fruition or not. But um, chemotherapy, bad. There are probably tricks to do away with. But in some with... cases, the best possibility oh, of yeah. that. In lots of cases. Absolutely. Yeah. I will say that there is a general issue with doctors will often elect not to take um, therapies for something like cancer that they would advise their patients to take. Mm -hmm. In some sense, the bias in medicine is, you know, you know, the patient is frightened and doesn't want to die. There's but, a bias to treat. Yeah. Because not treating uh, seems like a, a, it invites litigation. Well, it, it invites litigation and um, it also, you know, you have somebody terrified in your office who you've just told, you know, that they have a, a tumor and that, you know, it's, it's fatal. Mm -hmm. And the desire to live longer is completely understandable. But the question is, there is a trade-off between quality of life and length of life. And unless you've thought about that issue carefully ahead of time, then you know grasping for more life makes sense. But a doctor who's seen the cost up close may have a very different sense about whether it's worth it. Yeah. And I will point out that very... So it, you, you can't measure quality of life, really. But it seems like the analysis here is, uh, in some of these cases, the best case scenario might be you have 100 units of quality of yep. life, and you could experience those 100 units over two years or over one year, yep. right? And you know, do you want to have a better one year or a half as good two yep. years starting now, yep. right? Absolutely. And I will say that this is not about chemo or treatment. Um, but Norm Macdonald's death, I think, is a topic that just does not get enough attention. I don't remember the circumstances. Well, the circumstances uh, were, or, I, I don't think, remember anything were about medically it. unremarkable. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer, and it was terminal. And I will tell you, I actually interacted with him over Unity. Mm. Um, he was interested. He expressed some interest. And I was like, hey, can we get you on board? Can we have you on a podcast? Something like that. Yeah. And he was like, I don't know. Right? He didn't want to do it. And I did not know at the time that he was terminally ill. But of course, nobody knew that he was terminally ill because he, he did? literally, he did. Yeah. He literally didn't tell anyone. Yeah. And the, the reason I think that that's important is that he availed himself of a kind of value that most people bypass where he got to live the end of his life without cancer being the story, mm -hmm. right? He actually, you know, okay, you've got a certain number of months to, to live or a year to live. And the point is, well, I'd actually like to just have it. Yeah. I don't want everybody who interacts with me to be thinking, oh, is this the last time I'm going to see you? Right. I just want it to be normal. That's what I want is another no year of normal life or something mm -hmm. like that. And so anyway, I, I don't know what the answer is, but it did strike me as a this was a very intelligent guy. Mm -hmm. Right. Also very unusual and that he did something very unusual at the end of his life. Yeah. Um, was profound. To That's me. fascinating. I don't I I've, I've forgotten that if I knew it. Um, I'm recalling. I think some other famous person who obscured from her family and loved ones that she was sick until 
until either she was gone or like she had two days left or something. And I don't remember any of the details, even who it was, but as I remember it, there was at least one of her close, of her friends who thought of herself as very close anyway, which may be part of the story here, who was furious. He said, I, I, I wanted to be able to say goodbye. How, you know, how, how dare you keep me from being able to say goodbye? And I thought, oh, but I, I believe that what you got instead was a number of interactions with your friend. Uh, and, you, you know, it, it may be that there is something uh, that she needed to say. I think yeah. it was two women in this case. Um, that, re- that she really felt she needed to say. In which case, if, I mean, if you have those things, you should figure out a way to say them. Yeah. You should figure out a way to say them rather than know that like you're definitely going to want to do this before either of you die because obviously that could happen to anyone at any moment. Um, and it also felt like, you know, at some level it was a, a way to be angry at the situation and appear to be angry at the at the now dead friend rather than going through your grief yeah. or as part of your grief. Uh, but... It felt like it misunderstood the value in the decision, uh, and it, 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 as I remember it, it was presented as there was only one right thing to have done here. You owe it to inform the world when you get a diagnosis like this. And I thought, no, no, you do not. No, you do not. I mean, and and in part, I'm able to come to that conclusion very easily because so many of these diagno- diagnoses are only possible because of very recent technological right. developments, you know. and so you wouldn't know. And if there's a situation in which you wouldn't know, and if there's any part of you that wishes you didn't know, yeah. you certainly don't owe it to everyone else to inform them. Right. And, you know, the other part of you, you definitely said it, but I think it should be emphasized, which is to the extent that you think you have a right to know a life-ending diagnosis that somebody receives because you have things you need to say to them, those are things you need to say, and you you know the idea that you're waiting until you know somebody's on the way out is preposterous. You know, yeah. um, so th- those are not easy conversations to have. But I am a fan of the idea that you should keep accounts current. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are, of course, things in some in some relationships and some families that you don't want a person to be living with. Yeah, but you feel. Or would I, I'm not coming up with an example right now, and we're lucky not to have this. Yeah. Um, but where you feel like, actually, <clears throat> I want them to know this, even though they'll only know it for, you know, although I guess most, most it, of the time that's, the other way. yeah, it goes the other way. Yeah. It's, I don't, I don't want to live with this knowledge in the universe, but it, yep. it should be out there now that I'm not around to have to deal with it or the repercussions or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 No, I, I do think it usually goes the other way. Yeah. Um, that wasn't really about chemotherapy, but I see no, we, we got, got there. there. No, we, 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 we started it. there. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts? So I don't recognize the name of the, the company, but I, I know this plan. Um, any thoughts on Colossal trying to bring back the woolly mammoth, a cold resistant elephant with the core biological traits of the woolly mammoth? HTTPS colossal.com. Thank you. Um, last I checked into this, they weren't actually c- claiming to bring back the woolly mammoth. Yeah, they can't. The cl- which, of course, they can't. And so, you know, you and I got energized about this probably a decade ago. Like, what are they? Mm, they can't be doing what they claim to be doing. Like, who's not telling the truth where? And if you look at their fine print, I don't even remember. What are they doing? They, they've got well, they've like got some, fragments of a genome, and so they're yeah, gonna, and they're going to put they get fragments of woolly mammoth genome into its closest living relative, right? Yeah, uh, so into what is probably going to be an African elephant, be my guess. Um, but <clears throat> I don't think that's a terrific idea. But it's also not bringing back the woolly mammoth. And yep. what the, what irritates me the most there is the audacity in combination with the lying about it. Because if you if you're actually if you're knowledgeable enough to attempt this and think that you have any chance of success, you know that what you're doing is not bringing back the woolly mammoth. Yeah. And yet, that is clearly the story by which they're getting all the press. Yep. Well, I'd be more excited. I mean, I'd be excited if you could bring back a woolly mammoth. Mm-hmm. It's not uh, on the menu of possibilities here whether the thing that is on the menu of possibilities is worth doing or fair to the animal, especially in light of the fact that it's uh, 
a highly intelligent yes. um, critter. But uh, I would want a pygmy stegodon elephant. That's what I want. From Flores? Uh, from, it's not the Is only place they, they were, but that's, yeah. That's one of the, the microfauna that were on Flores yeah, in one Indonesia. Yeah, the, uh, the dwarfed um, with, island. With Homo floresiensis, the very short-statured uh, hominins. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I mean... Wouldn't it be cool to have a pygmy stegodon? How much? How, how how big were they actually? Uh, like a cow. Oh, yeah. You, you're hoping for like putting an elephant door and have them go in and out, or? I would totally do that for a pygmy stegodon elephant. You I would, would, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Yes, <laughs> I really would. Um, I think I would name him Bob. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, sure does. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Next question. We are well tuned to the danger posed by scary tribes. For instance, Islam and Trumpers, this person offers as the scary (laughs) tribes, um, but are often blind to the danger posed by institutions, for instance, the FBI and Pfizer, etc. To what do you attribute the societal blind spot? I feel like we were just talking about this last night with Jacob, actually, um, about the idea that you should... We all think we're looking for enemies, and the enemies come in the form of individuals, or in groups made up of individuals as opposed to organizations. And yes, you could frame an organization as a group made up of an individual, but the distinction is important. The distinction is basically Goliath versus possible Davids. Yeah, I I do think there's something... There's something about the novelty of institutions. I mean, obviously, institutions didn't exist Mm -hmm. in any meaningful sense 15,000 years ago. And populations have, and populations look like groups. So even if a group, you know, is also novel, it's novel in a form that we sort of expect it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also, I think there's a banality of evil point here too, Mm. which is that it's hard to model because you are a member of a group. You can model group dynamics. You've seen them, you've experienced them, you've participated in them, you've initiated them. Mm -hmm. You may or may not be part of an institution. If you're part of an institution, you may be, you know, oh, I keep my head down and do my job, and I don't think too much about how the institution works. Right. Um, So it's much harder to have an accurate enough model to be useful. And so we don't don't spend time modeling it because it's not productive. Mm -hmm. And that I think that is upending people like... uh, like Sam, mm. right? You know, mm-hmm. he, he dismissed a huge amount of what turned out to be right on the basis that it was conspiratorial. And it's like, well, damn, uh, yes, it, it is, but... It's not an argument. It's it's not an argument, right, exactly. Um, it, 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 well, to the degree that it is, it requires being explicit about the assumption that if conspiracy is part of your explanation... I have taken that off the table as even possibly true. Because if people are honorable and honest and complete, as clear thinkers should be, about knowing on what basis the foundations of their argument are resting, like how, how, how axiomatic can you go? What are the assumptions? What are the axioms? Like what, how, how can you reduce as much as possible the assumptions that you are making about the universe and, then, and, and list them? And then let's start. And if one of your starting points is conspiracy never happens, which appears to be uh, that I I think that that is just a linguistic reframing of the position that if it's a conspiracy, then you're crazy, right? Like I will not consider anything involving conspiracy. Isn't that the same thing as saying that conspiracy doesn't happen? And if that's an assumption, you need to make that really clear, and that needs to be part of every framing. Of the argument going forward. I don't think that's... Exa- I mean, uh, clearly, if we took if we took it literally, then it is. Mm-hmm. But I don't think... N- no intelligent person thinks conspiracy doesn't happen. You couldn't think that, because there are too many cases in which conspiracies have been... So what is it here? Conspiracy in this this case, under these conditions? Like, what, it's... Mm-hmm. The, then, the, then it's not even at assumption level. There's still... There's a whole lot of baggage built I in already. I think it's... Um, Fringe perspectives are wrong. Okay? Fringe perspectives are wrong is obviously wrong. But 
If you're faced with a fringe perspective, it's usually the right way to bet. Fringe perspectives are wrong is a winner more often than it's a loser. So it's taking a statistically reliable gambling strategy and mistaking it for truth. Right. It's And, it, you know, if you squint at it right, it's hill climbing versus valley crossing. In the language of adaptive landscapes. Right. So the point is, you can tend to go uphill by betting against the fringe perspective. It's typically correct, and so you'll go uphill. But if you're stuck on a low peak, it ain't going to get you to a higher one. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I think it's that. People are feeling clever because they've gone uphill. Mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah, the, we're, you know, you know, yes, that hill is eroding. Mm -hmm. And you've, yes, gotten yourself back to the top of it again, but you haven't done anything about the rate of erosion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so anyway, you know, it, to me, it's a red flag. Right, like at least what is the claim that something is incorrect because it's conspiratorial? Yeah, no, I mean I, that claim can be reframed as I said it, and yes, anyone, almost anyone reasonable will say no. Obviously, sometimes happens, but like if if really what you're claiming is that's not true because it's conspiratorial, then you've made yourself impossible to argue with in any way. And, and it's unfalsifiable. Yeah, but it's, it, it's even worse because effectively you, uh, in so doing, you're making a little profit, right? I get it that you're making a profit, but you're also signing us up for an existential threat that we don't have to face, mm. right? If you want to feel smug about staring down conspiracy theories and dismissing them without any consideration, I get why you feel smug, but I think your smugness is going to get us killed. And mm -hmm. it's a little like saying, you know, genocides don't happen. Yeah, usually they don't. But they do sometimes. And if you say shit like genocides don't happen, you're going to get us into one, right? You're going to ignore one that's happening because you, th you feel clever noticing it's that, that. It's not you're going to get us into one. Not that it's not possible, but it, much more. You will miss the signs when one does show up yeah you are going to get us into one one is going to be coming and you're going to say something clever about not worrying about it since genocides aren't real and my point is listen they're rare when one is coming there's nothing more important than knowing that that's what's going on right mm -hmm. so don't you dare sign me up for something that solves a problem you know 364 days a year that's not what i want i mm -hmm. want something that Airs in the direction of spotting the damn thing when it's happening because nothing is more important at that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes <clears throat> the trade-off is sometimes there will be concern when there wasn't reason for concern. Yep. That is the trade-off. Well, and you know, those of us who want to err in the other direction so we're sure and know that we make that error are not, you know, we're not dim-witted in the other direction. Right. right. We recognize that there's a problem that comes with talking about conspiracies. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not easy. It screws with Occam's razor. Right. And that's yep. that is a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who figured out how to do it well. And that's that's really the question. Yep. Seventeen seventy. This is just a statement. Seventeen seventy six. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Twenty twenty three. Experts hold these truths to be malinformation. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. That's very, very, yeah, very good. It is nice. I don't want to save that. Maybe I'll frame it. I can frame it. Um, how to deal with devaluation of the PhD title by people who get it in novel areas of woke science and with a distrust in real scientists? Well, the problem is older than that. You're going to need a time machine <laughs> and yeah. you're going to have to have a very compelling argument. And you're going to have to reach uh, a large number of people quickly. I, I think it's just too late. I think the point is if, if you don't realize that a PhD means nothing at this point, you're, you're not paying attention. And, you know, it is downstream of them having handed it out for non-work, you know, for poetry, that masquerading as science and all sorts of things. Well, but that, I mean... A P you get a PhD in something. Yep. So, you know, you, I think in poetry it would usually be an MFA, but um, say a, a PhD in literature should mean something. And it does not mean the same thing as a PhD in biology, which also doesn't mean the same thing as a PhD in mathematics. But more to the point, I think, like 
whether or not there is any consistency to what exactly uh, literature versus biology versus math PhD means. Um, between institutions, between decades, between mentors, there's almost no consistency. And I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't even require an ideology to have taken over. That doesn't require fake disciplines. It doesn't require whole institutions failing because they can't figure out how to say no to a mob, et cetera. It, it's just about the variation and then, you know, having, you know, just like most faculty are trying to reduce the amount of time they have to spend teaching because they don't think of it as their real work. And so, therefore, most college faculty aren't that amazing with students. Uh, it's different with grad students. You know, people are more, uh, are more rewarded for and usually by having solid relationships with grad students. But that can also become a distraction to what people consider their real work. And so um, putting people on it like, okay, just, you know, oh, you're in my lab, just do this project, right? In, in biology, with, you know, people who are smart and well-intended very often will end up with, you know, PhDs without ever having had to frame their own hypothesis or figure out what the experiment might be, right? And th like that, you know, not having done a complete piece of science, um, but having a PhD in a science is quite remarkable. And that's still a hell of a lot better than a lot of what is happening in academia. Yeah, but I still think at the end of the day, I'm not saying nobody who has a PhD is an expert in anything, obviously. But what I am saying is that the fact that somebody has a PhD is now inherently meaningless. Not only is it inherently meaningless because of woke insanity, which has done something special, where in order to get a PhD, you probably have to agree to things that are false, right? That's probably new. Um, but the funding structure of universities that handed these things out in lieu of money, right, uh, to induce people to do the work of the university to free the PIs to get the grants, that thing meant that you had a lot of people who were basically had an honorary degree in exchange for laboring, right? That wrecked the damn thing. Mm -hmm. um, the incom inconsistency between mentors that contributed to it but you know we just watched all the experts screw up the most important thing on earth and in unison say nonsense right so i think that demonstrates that whatever you know it may be a complex cocktail of things but whatever that complex cocktail is in the face of puzzles that were um manifestly comprehensible yeah um no and, you, and you're not you're talking about people with phds in you know traditional established real disciplines yep so i mean that's consistent with what i said you don't need, you don't have to go to the made-up disciplines like that that is obviously making adding adding fuel to the fire but uh, i mean gosh we've both said this so many places so many ways like you can't just scrape the ideology off the top. This this new ideology, which is at risk of destroying, you know, everything itself, but scrape it off the top and it will return in some other form unless you fix the fix the underlying structures. Yeah. Yeah. And it's possible that, you know, PhD is just done because, you know, once you've once you've created a zillion of these things that mean nothing, then you know, does it make sense to resurrect it or does it make some sense to build something new that actually does mean something where, where you can set a standard and you're not, um, you're not beholden to some long history that is now uh, a joke? Why do most people cringe at the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard? And why do some, but not most, cringe at the sound of thin plastic being crumpled? I've never heard the thin plastic one. It's wrong. It's not. It's just wrong. Our producer says it's just wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it's a reference to. I think she knows wherever she speaks. Uh, this uh, the person who is asking the question, but I, I've never heard it. Um, but the but the sound of fingernails on the chalkboard is obviously something that many of us. And I I, I always wonder how can you not how can you not cringe? Yeah, and I have no reaction to it. 
Yeah. Um, like what, and what, I wouldn't what say kind no. of alien are you? Uh, I'm, uh, I was it rhetorical? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm getting there. Working on it. Yeah. I am such an unusual person that I went 20,000 consecutive days without uh, gender flipping. So hmm. apparently, at least plausibly, that immunizes you to... Um, the, no, no, because I've gone almost... Like but six, not 60 quite days as many. Shy, right. sixty-five but days shy. Those are the those are the key days. Really? <laughs> so within the next unfortunately, two months, unfortunately, that makes a prediction. Yeah, that I'm within not the next two months, I too about. will not have a reaction to <laughs> fingernails on a chalkboard. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't know. Uh, let's put it this way: I don't have a reaction. If if you go up to a chalkboard and you do that thing, it doesn't bother mm, me. Even just like <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, if somebody, I is mean, a whiteboard, sure. A supremely whiteboard. Cracker. Must you? <laughs> uh, if somebody is drawing, like back in grade school, mm -hmm. you remember when they would draw the, what is it, a dashed line in, in between the two lines so you could. Oh, so you learn your cursive or something? Right, or exactly. printing? Yeah. And so weird. you remember they yeah. had a thing that would allow them to draw those things on the board, and every so often it would go wrong and it would go. I don't think I ever went to a school with those. I think they were uh, written onto the board permanently. It's like the boards have permanent makeup. Whoa. Well, in any case, every so often somebody <laughs> screws up at a chalkboard yeah. and it goes, yeah. and that does, doesn't, yeah. it alarms me. It yeah. doesn't, it's not like and, a. And that makes me jump a little bit, but, um, but no, the fingernails are so much worse. I, th I think I imagine them being ripped off. Yeah. Because it's going the wrong way. Everyone does. Yeah. They do? Yeah. So that's what Zach and I have arrived at because it seems like uh, they will start peeling off. So it's the the discomfort is not in your ear; it's in your in the visceral. Imagining. It's like imagining somebody falling off a, a bike or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, why? What do, well, oh, okay. Can, you're, you're talking. Exactly I thought you were going to put the is. sound on. Don't that do that. Imagine you have a piece of sheet metal. I do. And you have a flat, say you're at Home Depot, it's like a flat concrete floor, and you push it along that. Yeah. It's going to be just fine. No, it doesn't sound like it sounds great. Okay. It's just fine until it hits some little bump, and it, the whole thing buckles, and it's yep, terrible. Yep, yep, yep. It doesn't sound bad. It doesn't, because it's not your own fingers. But you, it brings up that sort of an image of what, at the point that you hit something that just pulls it too far. Yeah. And actually, it's interesting. I just cut my nails, and I don't really. I can imagine that, and it's not that bad. Oh, but if I haven't just cut my nails, it's terrible. It's awful. Oh, that's so. Yeah. Try this at home. Actually, that's fascinating. See if you're if if you are one of the people like most of us who aren't aliens who have this reaction to imagining nails on a chalkboard. See if your um, see if your visceral response is different before and after you cut your nails. That is fascinating, Zach. Yeah, because I like yeah. thought that I would love to do that with a chalkboard right now, but right. it certainly wouldn't bother me tremendously because there's no leverage. Because there's it's no just, leverage on it. Yeah. It, yeah, it would just be basically the very edge of the nail, and there's nothing that could really go wrong. That's interesting. I guess I'm trying to think. So, I mean, I, my nails are always short, but they're not nearly as short as they were when I was playing two hours of piano a day for yeah. many years, when they had to be very very short and. I guess a prediction here would be that during those eight years or whatever of my childhood, uh, I didn't have a stronger reaction either. Hmm. Right? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Um, I, it. I thought all you people were freaking out because it hurt your ears. Well, that is the experience. Like, it, oh. the experience is it messes, like, you really can't take the noise. But it's because... Like I can deal with noise just fine right now, but if I go a month, it's going to be so. Very so another hard another noise. Another test that could be done is make a sound that sa that two two versions, I guess. That sound, but compel the person that is being that is it is being played to that it is a different sound. Like come up with something that sounds very much like it and tell them this is this is something entirely different right. and see if they have the same reaction and try to fully replicate it such that it really isn't that. Yeah. And I, tell them that it isn't and see if see yep. if they react the same. I way. also just realized that if I, I since I literally just cut my nails, they're so short that if I did that on a chalkboard, it actually wouldn't make the same sound. It just could just be like finger pads. No no no, I can get the nails on it, but it would just be like two slightly abrasive surfaces just rubbing against each other. It's just very different from the, like, you get a little bit of resonance if you have mm -hmm. nails that are anywhere more And it does, like it does risk chattering, like sheet metal on a concrete floor, like you're going to hit something. And Yeah, no, no, no. It's very, very uncomfortable if you have even just, like, two millimeters of nail mm -hmm. past the end of your fingers. It's another one of my superpowers. 
What's not, that? Not giving a damn about that noise. It's like kryptonite for you folks. Am I wrong? <laughs> a little, uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. A little oh, bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the thin plastic being crumpled, though. Never heard that one. Yeah, me either. Probably not surprising because they're part of the TNI. Uh, uh, Trusted News Initiative. Probably not surprising because they're part of the TNI, but when I voice search Google for darkhorsesubmissions.com, none of the results on the first page point to the actual site. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that's actually informative at all. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if contracting a virus and surviving is not a net positive for evolution. Why are we interpreting viruses as threats versus natural processes? Maybe we are suppressing nature. Uh, yeah, I, I doubt this. There's, well, and there's just the devil's going to be in the details of what the virus is. Yeah, I mean, and to the extent that it is not the case, then the immune system will not resist, and so we may not notice it, right? So to the extent that there is truth in what is being said here, the point is it's probably mm. a cryptic phenomenon. And there is a lot of integration of viruses into genomes and things like that. So anyway, when we fight, it's probably because it's not good to be infected. But at the, the bottom layer, a viral infection involves your cells doing the bidding of some other creature. And it's very hard for that to be mutualistic because your immune system will regard the production of that foreign stuff as an indicator that the cells need to be killed, which will accelerate the aging of whatever tissue they were in. So, yeah. you know, accelerating aging is, is just, it's damage. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, the end of the sentence, the way it's phrased, you know, threats versus natural processes, it's both, right? There's plenty of things that are both. Yeah. And so I, I think that the question, you know, maybe we're suppressing nature. Well, yeah, because uh, we can't all just get along equally. You know, there, there, there is vying for limited resources, and uh, we engage in that vying in lots of different ways. Uh, but more often than not, exactly as you are pointing to, a virus that is trying to infect a human body uh, is a competitor at some level. And sometimes it's going to be a long-term competitor that we can't know the implications of. Yep. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's good. How does one cope with and combat the curse of Cassandra and the feelings of hopelessness that come with it? Or are they just doomed to failure? <clears throat> I thought I heard you say cursive Cassandra. Yeah, I heard that too. The curse of Cassandra. Yeah. Cassandra <clears throat> was cursed by Zeus, I want to say. Maybe not. Maybe I've got the wrong mythological universe. Um, to tell the truth and never be believed. Right. I My thought... parents were going to name me Cassandra and decided not to because they didn't want to bestow upon me the curse of Cassandra. But here we are. Here we are. <laughs> 2023. <laughs> um, yeah, so the curse of Cassandra is somebody who warns of the demise of cursive and is not listened to. Um, Do you go on? No, I, I'm, that's, I'm just... But the, the, the actual question. Right. Um, so the, the question is... How do, how do we deal with it? Uh, there are a lot of us who are truth-telling and attempting to truth-tell, and to some degree we know it, we know that we've been right about stuff that has been not believed, that people are coming up with reasons and excuses to not believe it still, even when the evidence mounts. How to deal with it? Well. And you know how to, how to cope with it and also how to fight against the curse and to be, you know, be more believed when you're really trying to do the right thing. I think the son of a bitch has handed us a terrible um, weapon in this battle, which is that lots of people, in fact, I noticed uh, during the brief break between the main podcast and the Q&A mm -hmm. that... Um, why am I forgetting Dilbert's uh, creator? Scott Adams, Scott Adams um, mm -hmm. put out a video in which he said, can we all agree that the anti-vaxxers, which he doesn't really mean anti-vaxxers, he means people who didn't get the COVID vaccines, mm -hmm. were right, at least at this point. What? Um, Scott Adams? Yeah. Anyway, I mean, his, his, his point, I watched most of his video, his point was, look, uh, if you're not vaccinated for covid then you don't have to worry about what damage that thing did and you know 
I, I think this every time I get my heart heart rate up doing something is thank goodness I don't have to worry about whether or not there's a hidden time bomb in the wall of my heart, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, the answer is you don't want to be in that predicament. Something caused a lot of people to do stuff that many of them now regret having done. So the point is this was never an abstract discussion. This was not a classroom exercise to see who could marshal the cleverest arguments. This was really an argument about what you as an individual should or should not do, and all of us who were adults at the time that this happened had a choice. Are you going to take the thing, or are you not going to take the thing? Or are you going to take this version of the thing and not that version of the thing, right? Those were all choices, and the point is, look, certain people got this right. Some of them might have gotten it right by accident. That is possible. But some of them seem to have a track record. Maybe at the point that you get to the place where you're now regretting and altering your choice so that it's, you don't do it to yourself again, the point is, well, geez, you know, I thought I should be listening to the CDC and the WHO. It turned out that didn't work out. And then there were some people I didn't think I should be listening to, and now I'm doing what they did. And so... Maybe next time, at least, I'm not going to go in there reflexively listening to the CDC and the WHO. I'm going to listen to the people who seem to figure out how to navigate the evidence. So anyway, I think I think that's kind of where we are. Is that we are we we? It's too easy to forget that this isn't a done deal, and it was never abstract. Mm -hmm. This was about real stuff, and people are now, if they're thinking. They are retracing their steps, and hopefully the point is, well, you know, can I introduce you to Cassandra? Because she had it right, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. In your opinions, what will be the state of academia in 10 years' time? It's either going to be limping along, more brittle and fragile and uninspired than ever or there will have been one or three or five or eight forays into something new actually really new uh, that uh, are anti-fragile and uh, you know bring us back into a state of at least having a system of higher ed that has a chance of uh, brokering knowledge in this bizarrely quickly evolving world yeah so i will i will try um to add a few more steps in here i think we have now poisoned the well so that there is no meaning in the degree that somebody walks away with and that those who are trying to accomplish something employers who want to hire somebody competent are going to catch on to this pattern that they can't uh they can't detect somebody's level of capacity um, based on their academic record. And they're going to start hiring people based on proxies. And those who are good at it are going to figure out what proxies are actually meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get a kind of gold rush to find the people who aren't academic, don't have a CV or a degree or whatever, but show the hallmarks of capacity. And as that happens, no reasonable person is going to send their offspring to these institutions. These institutions are going to be starved for people who want to do something technical or want to do science, right? Anything hard-headed is not going to work. And these institutions can't survive on the woke nonsense fields, right? Those woke nonsense right. fields don't bring in the the money and mm -hmm. so they will fall apart and the, that is what will fuel a boom in alternative institutions mm -hmm. and so maybe this is wishful thinking but i hope that the collapse of those institutions as a result of their own greed and idiocy will um, take out the accreditation system along with it and mm -hmm. free people who understand the importance of a proper educational system to uh, build one from the ashes. And I would point out that that does mean that there will be an awful lot of campuses that uh, 
have no purpose but have wonderful buildings in which you could put books and hold classes and things like that. So I won't be surprised if the new university system ends up in the buildings of the old one mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. there isn't some cryptic changeover, but something like that. Yeah. Okay, one story and one last question, and then we're out. Okay. Uh, I believe that mammo at the beginning here means mammogram. I had a mammogram yesterday. Offered me a mask. I said, no thanks. She told me it's required. I walked the F out. This was after early check-in where they asked me my assigned sex at birth and current gender. If I'm right, this was a mammogram. It's mammo, M-A-M-M-O. Current gender, that's in keeping with the silliness. Um, assigned sex at birth and a mammogram. Right. That's great. That's amazing. Wow. It's so good. <laughs> it's, it's one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's perfect, right? It is evidence that the system is completely devoid of meaning. Oh, you've just given birth. And are you the mother or the father? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, it's, it's great. I love it. I mean, if it, you know, if we're gonna do this stupid, it <laughs> let's as well go be all the way. Let's go all in. Completely go transparently all in. stupid. Yep. 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 Oh, and that was from someone whose whose name was I finally caught up with it. Malin Formation. Malin Formation. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay. One last question: Why is it the farm chickens that get bird flu are all destroyed instead of discovering the survivors and breeding those resistant birds? Probably because it would take longer. Is, is I, like I don't know anything about you know gigantic commercial chicken breeding operations except that they're horrible, um, but my guess is that it's a simple, uh, simple short-sighted economic decision. Whereas, from what little I know, it does seem like letting selection do its job and taking the resistant birds would be a better move. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think you would need. Like a second facility. That's it. Depends on how how contagious it is, if how you, virulent it is. Yeah. If you prepare, well, the problem is in because bird flu is transmissible to people. Mm. The idea of preserving birds that appear to be resistant, yeah, runs the risk that you are preserving. Maybe it's just latent. Yeah, exactly that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe that's maybe that's the answer. That's where we'll end. All maybe, right. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's... This has been Maybe That's the Answer with Brett and Heather. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, cool. Well, uh, we will see you next week if you're here. And if you're not, uh, find us later. Yeah. Uh, but consider sharing, subscribing, liking, all that good stuff uh, on any wherever it is that you find our, our stuff. We've got Dark Horse Channel channels now at all the major social media sites and um, yeah I don't think I have anything else I think we're there so until we see you next time be good to the ones you love eat good food and get outside be well everyone <laughs>